Hey everyone, welcome back and thank you for joining us again in our next discussion of statistics. Jumping into our objective then, a z-score measures how many standard deviations the data value is above or below the mean. Just to repeat because it's easily forgotten, remember it's how many standard deviations a data value is above or below a mean. We see the formulas below. Notice that the z-score formula for a population and a sample are very similar, just the notation or technicality changes working with population data or sample data. We need to know that a negative z-score would indicate that the data value is below the mean, and we'll use this in context of answers, while a positive z-score would indicate that the data value is above the mean. Note that z-scores are typically rounded to two decimal places. Jumping into our example then, we're filling out an application for college. The application requests that we use either our ACT score or our SAT1 score. They tell us you scored a 32 on the ACT and a 635 on the SAT. On the ACT exam, the mean score is 30 with a standard deviation of 4, while the SAT has a mean score of 505 with a standard deviation of 109. So which test score should you provide on your application and why? The big idea here is, to answer the question which test score should you provide on your application, we want to know which test did we score better on relative to the average. The key word there is relative to the mean. That tells us to go into the idea of z-scores because z-scores will translate and standardize the information for us. Going into the math, first we need to find the z-score for each of the tests. So the z of our ACT test would be of course the formula x minus mu divided by sigma or we're taking our data from the ACT exam. The value we have for x would be 32 since that was our score on the ACT test and the mean on the ACT is 30. And we divide that by 4 since that was the standard deviation of the ACT exam, which gives us a z-score of a 0 0.50 on the ACT. Now the z on the SAT score is still the same formula, x minus mu, all over sigma. We scored a 635 on the SAT, and the mean value of the SAT was a 505. The standard deviation of the SAT was a 109, which means we end up with a z-score of approximately 1.19. Therefore, I should provide my SAT score because I scored higher on it compared to the average test score as shown by the higher z-score. On to our next example then. We're told a highly selective boarding school will only admit students who place at least 1.5 standard deviations above the mean on a standardized test that has a mean of 200 and a standard deviation of 26. What is the minimum score that an applicant must make on the test to be accepted? The first clue is that the comparison is with standard deviations, so immediately we want to be thinking z-scores. Then of course they give us the mean and the standard deviation, but they ask us what is the minimum score that an applicant must make, which means now instead of looking for z, we're looking for x. Just to repeat, remember z is the number of standard deviations away from a mean, while x is a value in context of the story they're giving us. We are using the z formula again, so we've got z is equal to an x minus a mu, all of that over a sigma. They told us that the school will only admit students who place at least 1.5 standard deviations above the mean, so z is a 1.5, x is what we're looking for, the mean score was 200 and the standard deviation was 26. Substituting that into our formula then, we want to solve for x. Jumping back to our algebra days, we need to isolate x by multiplying both sides of the equation by 26. That gives us 39 equal to our x minus 200. And then of course we can add 200 to both sides in order to isolate and solve for x where we get x is equal to a 239. So the minimum score that an applicant must make on the test would be a 239. Moving to another example, this will give us a little bit deeper of a perspective and preview of an example then because we have to interpret a bit more in order to even recognize that we want to be using z-scores. We're told sports enthusiasts love to debate who is a better player when a direct comparison cannot occur. For example, in 2010, Josh Johnson of the Florida Marlins had the lowest ERA of any starting pitcher in the National League with an ERA of a 2.3. Meanwhile, Clay Buckles of the Boston Red Sox finished second in the American League with an ERA of a 2.33. 
In the National League, the mean ERA in 2010 was 3.622, and the standard deviation was a 0.743. In the American League, the mean ERA in 2010 was a 3.929, and the standard deviation was a 0.775. Finally, we get to the key point here for us as the student, which player had the better year relative to his peers, and why? Now the phrase relative to his peers is a good clue for us to be thinking z-scores because it standardizes the data for us. So now we're going to find the z-score for each of these pitchers in order to compare who had the better year. So first we're going to find the z-score for Josh Johnson. Remember the z-score formula is x minus mu over sigma. x would be Josh Johnson's ERA and he had an ERA of a 2.30. We're going to subtract that by the mean which was a 3.622. Remember, Josh Johnson was in the National League, so our mean was 3.622. Divided by the standard deviation of the National League, which would be the 0.743. Doing that math, we end up with a z-score for Josh Johnson of a negative 1.78, approximately. And we can move over to the z-score for Clay Buckles. Same formula, where we've got x minus mu over sigma. Buckles had an ERA, which is our x value, of 2.33 and we're subtracting that by the American League ERA, which was a 3.929. Dividing by the 0 0.775, which is the standard deviation of the American League, we end up with a z-score for buckles of a negative 2.06. Now we have our z-scores. Again, Josh Johnson was a negative 1.78, and buckles was a negative 2.06, which means Clay Buckles is further below the mean than Josh Johnson. Now in context of the story, a lower ERA is better because ERA is the number of runs that are given up per nine innings and as a pitcher we want to give up less runs. This is the interpretation part that can be a bit tough sometimes if you don't know context of the story. So make sure you ask or are clear on context of the story as to what is quote unquote better. In baseball, a lower number is better for the ERA. Therefore, Clay Buckles had a better year relative to his peers based on his z-score. He was more standard deviations below the mean of the American League than Josh Johnson was in the National League. Our next objective would be the idea of percentiles and more specifically what our textbook calls the kth percentile. The kth percentile is a value such that approximately k percent of the observations in a data set are less than or equal to the value discussed. So k is going to be a value for us, but what we want to remember is the less than or equal to the value discussed, as that's a big deal. But let's go ahead and jump into the example real quick, as it's a lot easier to understand through the example. We're told the GRE is a test required for admission to many U.S. grad schools. The University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health requires a GRE score no less than the 70th percentile, which is some key vocab for us to get us in this percentile mode for admission into their human genetics program. Interpret this admissions requirement. In order to interpret, we just need to know the definition of percentile. Because if we see percentile, we know what that represents. The 70th percentile represents the value such that 70% of the observations in the data set are less than or equal to the value discussed. Thinking of that in another way, in order to be admitted into this program, an applicant must score as high or higher than 70% of the people who take the GRE. That is, an individual's score must be in the top 30%. So the 70th percentile represents the top 30%. Let's go ahead and jump into another quick example just to create another opportunity for understanding. Sticking with the idea of the GRE, let's say that Stanford requires a GRE score no less than the 85th percentile for admission into their MBA program. Again, the key vocab for us is that they mention the word percentile, so we want our minds to go to that definition. So in order to be admitted, an applicant would have to score in the top what percentage on the test? Well, if we're in the 85th percentile, then that means we must be in the top 15% which of course we get simply by taking 100% minus the 85%. Continuing to our next objective, we have a discussion of quartiles, which divide data sets into fourths or four equal parts. As you see the figure, we have the smallest data value, the median and the largest data value, and then you see Q1, Q2, and Q3. Now Q1 and Q3 would divide the lower half in again another half, and then Q3 divides the upper half in again another half. But to elaborate on that a little bit, the first quartile, Q1, is equivalent to the 25th percentile. 
it divides the bottom 25% of the data from the top 75%. The second quartile is equivalent to the median, and that just splits our data, all of our data, in half, bottom and top 50%. The third quartile, Q3, is equivalent to the 75th percentile, which means we've got 75% of the data that is below this mark and 25% of the data that would be above that mark. And finally, the fourth quartile is just the maximum value. Now, we don't usually say Q4, and we also don't usually say Q2. Instead, we just call those the median and also the maximum. That takes us over to the idea of finding these quartiles then. It is very similar to when we found the median in previous discussions. First, we need to arrange the data in ascending order. Next, we want to determine the median of the entire set of data, which is exactly what we did previously. And then the first quartile, Q1, is simply the median of the bottom half of our data, while the third quartile, Q3, is simply the median of the top half of our data. So we're literally just finding the median of some set of data three times. Finally, make sure you're careful of that note. If the number of observations is odd, do not include the median when determining Q1 and Q3 by hand. So let's go ahead and jump over to our example. We're told a group of BYU students collected data on the speed of vehicles traveling through a construction zone on a state highway where the posted speed was 25 miles an hour. The recorded speed of 14 randomly selected vehicles is given below, and we're asked to find and interpret the quartiles for speed in the construction zone. As previously stated, step one would be to organize our data in ascending order, so let's go ahead and do that. Remember, we've got 14 randomly selected vehicles, so our entire sample size here is 14. Referring back to how we found the median previously, when we have an even amount of data, I need to take the mean of the two middle values. So just to help visually, I'm going to underline the bottom half of our data separate from the top half of our data, which means in order to find the median, we need to take the mean of those middle two values. If we take the mean of those two values, 32 plus 33 divided by 2 gives us a 32.5, and we've got ourselves our median. Now to find Q1, remember that's the median of the bottom half of our data. So we're only looking at the bottom half of our data, which goes from 20 up to our 32. And remember, Q1 would be the median of that bottom half. Now we only have seven pieces of data in that bottom half of our information. Therefore, we get to take the middle value, and the middle value would be 28. So our Q1 is 28. Similarly speaking, to find Q3, we're only looking at the top half of our data, which goes from 33 up to our last piece of data, which would be 40. Now again, we only have seven data points on the top half of our data. Since it's odd, we get to take the middle value again, which would be 38. And our Q3 is equal to 38. That takes us to the interpretation of these values. Q1 is approximately 25% of the speeds are less than or equal to 28 miles an hour, and 75% of the speeds are greater than 28 miles per hour. Remember, this is our 25th percentile. The median, which is our Q2, simply states that approximately 50% of the speeds are less than or equal to the 32.5 mile per hour mark, and 50% of the speeds are greater than 32.5 miles per hour. Lastly, our Q3 means that approximately 75% of the speeds are less than or equal to, yet again, 38 miles an hour, and 25% of the speeds are greater than 38 miles per hour. Now our next objective would be the idea of the interquartile range. The interquartile range, which we call IQR, is the range of the middle 50% of the observations in the data set. Careful with this, it's the middle 50%. The IQR is the difference between Q1 and Q3 and is found using the following formula, where IQR is equal to Q3 minus Q1. Jumping quickly into our example then, we're asked to determine and interpret the interquartile range of the speed data in the last example. Remember, we already found that Q1 is 28 and Q3 was 38. So the IQR, where we did Q3 minus Q1, was 38 minus 28, and we get that to be 10. So our interpretation is the range of the middle 50%, which is the definition of our IQR, of the speed of cars traveling through the construction zone is 10 miles an hour, and we're all set. Now let's jump into the next example where we're going to discuss the mean, median, and IQR all together. We're told suppose a 15th car travels through the construction zone that we were previously discussing and it's going 100 miles an hour. They ask find the mean, median, and interquartile range and discuss how the 15th car impacts those three values. 
So we're given the new data set, including the 100 mile an hour car. And thank goodness it's in ascending order, so we don't have to do that again. Since they're asking us to find the mean, median, and interquartile range, that means we have to find multiple pieces. Now I'm going to go ahead and find the median first, and then we know to find the interquartile range, we need Q1 and Q3, so we'll do that next. To find the median, I'm going to underline the bottom half of the data and then separate it from the top half of the data. But now since we have 15 cars, remember the median is simply the middle value. So that means our median is the nice happy 33. We don't have to find the mean of the middle two values like we did previously because we now have an odd number of observations in our data set. Now that we have our median, remember Q1 is simply the median of the bottom half of our data. In the bottom half of our data, which is underlined in orange, we have seven pieces of data again. Remember, we do not include the median since we had an odd number of observations. Therefore, from the bottom half, we get to take the middle value again, which is just 28. So our Q1 is 28. Going over to find Q3, just like how we did Q1, we need the median now of the top half of our data like we did previously. Again, we have seven observations in the top half, which means we're just going to take the middle value. To make it nice and easy, we get ourselves a Q3 of 39. Now that we have Q1 and Q3, we can go ahead and find our IQR, since we know the formula is Q3 minus Q1, which means we've got 39 minus 28, giving us an IQR of 11 miles an hour. Which means we have our median, we have our IQR, we need to go ahead and find the mean. Remember to find the mean of our data, we would simply take the sum of all the observations and then divide by the size, which in this case would be a sample. So we end up simply taking the sum of all those observations and dividing by 15. We're not going to do this by hand though, instead we get approximately 36.7. And we have our mean, median, and IQR. Moving over to the discussion then, since we were asked to discuss how the 15 car impacted the mean, median, and interquartile range, we want to notice that the mean speed increased from a 32.1, which we found previously, to a 36.7 when we added a new piece of data in. However, the median speed only increased from 32.5 to 33, an increase of half a mile an hour, and the IQR only increased from 10 to 11 miles an hour. The point of the discussion would be, based on our results, would you say that the IQR is sensitive or resistant to outliers? And since the IQR did not change significantly from that 100 mile an hour addition, we can go ahead and say that it is resistant to outliers. Our next objective then has us detailing what an outlier is. We have steps to determine if something is an outlier. The first thing we do is determine the first and third quartiles of the data. Then we're going to compute the IQR. Then we're going to determine the fences. Now fences serve as a mathematical cutoff for us in order to determine outliers. Comparing data to our fences allows us to figure out if we have outliers to create the conclusion, which would be our step four. Once we construct our fences, we can determine if a data value is less than the lower fence or greater than the upper fence, and therefore an outlier. So let's jump straight into our example then. We're asked to check the speed data for outliers. The original data set was provided below. Notice that the 100 has been removed just to eliminate any confusion. Step one, if you don't remember, we previously found Q1 and Q3. We got Q1 to be 28 and Q3 to be 38. We then found the IQR of our speed data, which was our Q3 minus Q1, giving us a 38 minus 28, which of course is equal to 10. And now we're able to calculate the lower and upper fences. Make sure we're careful with these formulas. A lot of times people make some small detailed mistakes, so just being careful with it. It's Q1 minus the 1.5 times the IQR. We have Q1 as 28 minus 1.5 times our IQR that is 10, and that will give us 13. Now the upper fence, make sure we're careful. Q3 plus the 1.5 IQR means that we have 38 plus a 1.5 times our IQR of 10, and that gives us 53. Now that we've calculated our lower and upper fence, remember the definition of an outlier would be a piece of data that is less than the lower fence or greater than the upper fence. To create a bit of a visual, let's create a number line then. We've got a lower fence of 13 and an upper fence of 53, and we're looking for any data that falls outside of that interval. Looking at our data above, the smallest piece of data we have would be 20, and the largest piece of data we have is 40. Therefore, none of our data falls outside the interval of 13 to 53. That is, we have no pieces of data that are less than the lower fence 
which is 13, and we have no data that is greater than 53, which is our upper fence. Therefore, our conclusion is we have no outliers. And thank you again for joining us.